Welcome to our Permanente Live webinar, Meeting the Health Needs of an Aging Population. I'm Stephen Perotti, an infectious disease physician and executive vice president with the Permanente Federation. I'm so pleased to serve as your moderator today for this informative and engaging conversation. Before we get started, I wanna share with you that you can join the conversation on social media using the event hashtag, hashtag permliveaging. Please submit any questions using the Q&A function in this Zoom meeting. We want you to be a part of this conversation. We're first gonna engage with our national experts on the topic of aging, and then we're gonna get into your questions. Today's topic is an important one for all of us as physicians, clinicians, and caregivers of loved ones. By 2040, we expect 22% of the country's population to be 65 or older. That's nearly 81 million people. The unique opportunities and challenges of caring for this growing population when it comes to their medical, social, behavioral, and mental health needs are enormous. 95% of the geriatric population has at least one significant chronic condition and 80% have two. The long-term needs for seniors is significant according to the Administration for Community Health Living. Someone turning 65 today has a 70% chance of needing some form of long-term care support in their lifetime. Up to 20% may need long-term care for longer than five years. And while we often think of long-term care in the context of institutions, such as skilled nursing facilities, 80% of adults want to stay in their home and the community that they know. And we know that the children of caregivers and caregivers of this fastest growing generation in the United States are just as affected because their commitment to support their loved ones. The National Alliance for Caregiving and AARP have reported that nearly one in five adults provide unpaid care to an adult who has health or functional needs. So really in a way, we're all in this together. There are some critical questions to answer. How do we prepare for these realities as a healthcare system? How do we prepare as a society for what will be a significant community and public health need that's not been experienced by this nation before? The need for greater understanding of the implications of this demographic change and action is timely. Supporting the goal for allowing people to age with dignity, independence, and choice has never been more pressing and important. I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel of experts. We're joined by Terry Fulmer, who is a nurse and president of the John A. Hartford Foundation, a private enterprise with the mission to improve the care of older adults. She is a leading expert in geriatrics and is known for her work on elder abuse and neglect. Dr. Wendy Gazanski is a geriatrician and vice president and chief quality officer with the Colorado Permanente Medical Group. Dr. Gazanski is a senior clinician investigator with the Institute of Health Research in Colorado, and her studies include work to improve the health and health care for older adults. Dr. Sachin Jain is the CEO of the SCAN Group and SCAN Health Plan, along at, amongst the largest Medicare Advantage plans in the country. He is a frequent speaker and columnist on health issues and was named by Modern Healthcare as one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare. Susan Reinhardt is a nurse and senior vice president at AARP and is the director of AARP's Public Policy Institute. With extensive experience and expertise in health and long-term care policy, she oversees research and analysis on public policy issues, including leading the Institute's family caregiving initiatives. Thank you all for joining us today. Terry, I wanna start with you. And why don't we dive into some of the opportunities that health systems have for caring for a population um, like the aging population in the US. The Johnny Hartford Foundation is leading the movement to spread age-friendly care throughout the country and the world by engaging health systems and other care locations. Can you tell us a little bit about what age-friendly care is? and why older adults need it. Thank you so much. I would love to do that. 
Hi, everybody. And I only wish I could be with you in person. It's such an opportunity to speak to this distinguished group. Thank you to the Permanente Federation for this session and to Kaiser Permanente for your ongoing commitment to improving care for older adults. So important. Steve, you're right. We do have a growing number of older people, which is the greatest success story of the 20th century. Doubling lifespan in 100 years is a pretty big deal. And what we like to think about is the way in which we enhance those years for every older person and for their families with them. So, you know, we, we know that longevity and that success story provides incredible contributions from these, old, these, these uh, older people in their communities. And by meeting their needs in an age-friendly care approach, physicians and health systems can do what they love best, providing high-quality patient-centered care, meeting shared goals with the older patients, and making practice more streamlined, team-based, and more fulfilling. And let me underscore team-based. Every person who listens to this broadcast will say, oh my gosh, I can't do one more thing. Will you really can streamline your work and do things much more effectively. Age-friendly care means you're using a 4M approach, which means that you are doing four things in the 4M set. You know what matters to your older patient and their families, and you align that care with each older adult's specific health care outcome goals and preferences. Maybe you do that in your annual Medicare wellness visit. Maybe you do that in uh, your ICU, but knowing what matters. Next, medications. If they're necessary, making sure you're using age-friendly medications and de-prescribing wherever possible. Mentation, preventing, identifying, and treating and managing dementia, depression, delirium, anything having to do with mood and memory. And mobility, ensuring that older people move safely every day in order to maintain function. Let me simply say that it doesn't matter whether you're 60 or 80, your function will be will be specific to you. So that's why these uh, goals and preferences are so important. Everything we do is evidence-based, cause no harm, and more importantly, aligns with what matters. So our age-friendly approach, uh, it really is, is so exciting to me. I, I travel around the world now and around the country all the time, helping people think about the way in which to do this work. And when we focus on the forums as a set, you achieve exponentially better outcomes. The data are clear. If you go on the IHI website or the American Hospital Association website, what we find is that we're reducing readmission, that we are improving mobility, that we are decreasing delirium, which you know not only counts up to millions of dollars, which is one thing, but guess what? It's quality care, it's respectful care, and it's care that changes the whole paradigm for that older person. So Kaiser Permanente has 11 sites, and I have a very special place in my heart for Woodland Hills, where I personally visited and saw their great, great work. And so I just want to thank you all. And again, thanks to IHI and AHA for all they do with us. And back to you, Steve. Well, thank you, Terry. And, um, you know, Wendy, this is sort of a good segue here, um, talking about, you know, person-centered care, um, outcomes-driven, um, either research and or actual clinical care. And so I'm interested in getting your perspective on those age-friendly concepts. Um, and what does that look like for a large system like ours um, and for permanent medical groups? And then probably looking beyond that, right? What does that look like for other health systems um, here in the US uh, that are trying to provide in care, integrated care and coverage? Yeah, you know, I think, um... Terry's point around that we want to really use that age-friendly model to enhance care um, for folks. And I think that using that approach where we're really um, looking at those key items that can create a very different situation when you're looking at an older adult. You know, as a geriatrician, um, I still practice um, in our skilled nursing facility post-acute rehab setting. And, you know, when patients have been in the hospital and they get delirious, I mean, the stories from them and their families are just devastating. I mean, people are frightened. The families are frightened. And so I think that the work that we can do at the system level, um, you know, I would like to think that, you know, geriatricians are one of the happiest subspecialists out there. Um, and yet they're aren't enough of us when you consider those numbers that you talked about. And so we really have to take our system like 
Kaiser Permanente as an integrated delivery system and work to what I call geriatricize the rest of primary care, the subspecialties. And I think that there have been some good examples of doing that in a way. I think, you know, um, with uh, the Permanente Medical Group work in Northern California with senior surgical care has been an excellent example of how we can take the 4M concept and apply it to older adults going through surgery, make sure we're taking that interdisciplinary team, meaning it's not just the surgeon, it's also the primary care doc, it might be the geriatrician and the paliatrician consult, as well as the nutritionist and the physical therapist. And if all of us come together and come up with a plan, then that patient is going to have a much safer surgery, they're going to know what to expect, we're going to have that anticipatory guidance about what's going to happen after afterwards. And I think a lot of the systems that we need to have in place are about bringing that interdisciplinary team together, making sure that we're using those geriatric best practices, a lot of which is a little bit more of that medical minimalism and trying to figure out what the patient really wants, what, what, what matters most to them, and then having those standards in place. And I think that really does create the quadruple aim outcomes in that not only do patients and families feel better, but actually as care providers, um, a lot of the work we've done with, you know, other types of systems um, in sort of uh, Woodland Hills and Primary Care Plus, as an example, um, was a way that not only did the patients benefit, but the providers also felt so much more job satisfaction. And I think that's really important in our current times. Thank you, Wendy. You know, Sachin, I I think about the the stakes that that we're facing, right? Just in terms of the sheer numbers of of patients, and then you think about what we're facing as a healthcare system coming out of COVID nineteen. Um, you know, with the healthcare workforce being strained, and I heard both Terry and Wendy talk about team based care, um, which may or may not be new to to folks in terms of having to think about that. And then I, I heard the reference actually about delirium um, and was struck by the publications out there that say that the mortality rate, so much less forget the debility, but the mortality rate at one year if somebody develops delirium in a hospital is 10 to 15%. So you've talked about inflection points in healthcare um, and watershed moments in healthcare. Talk to us a little bit about what you think about those kinds of concepts in the context of the aging population? Sure. So, um, Stephen, my reference point over the last fifteen years was um, as a you know federal official at CMS, um, and then leading CareMore, which is an in integrated health plan and delivery group, and then most recently leading Scan. But I would say the reference point that's been most influential in my thinking over the past three years has actually been watching my father. Um, age, you know, further into his life, um, and having experienced a number of, you know, very significant inflection points that I think are have been unmanaged or undermanaged by the healthcare system. Um, and when I say inflection points, I'll, I want to just get really tangible. Um, you know, when we turn sixty-five, that's a major inflection point in our lives. That's when we become uh, part of the Medicare program. We're officially uh, categorized as older adults. Um, when we develop a new chronic disease, that's an inflection point. Um, when we suffer our first fall as an older adult, that's an inflection point. When we develop a cancer diagnosis, that's an inflection point. When we start dialysis, that's an inflection point. And these are the moments that are where things are most likely to go wrong for patients. And we have a healthcare system and we have a Medicare program that I think has not necessarily been designed to support people during those inflection points. And that became really clear for me um, when my father did break his hip um, and needed a whole bunch of different types of support. But what I really found was um, uh, the things that we call care management was really what I now call strangers meeting strangers. Um, <laughs> you know, People who don't know you, doing their very best to get to know you as quickly as possible and providing you with what they think is supportive but is actually oftentimes orthogonal from what you really need in that moment. 
which is how do we get that bed into the household? How do we arrange the physical therapy? How do we get the transportation from home to dialysis when you have a fra fractured hip? Um, in the absence of that kind of support, we're all figuring it out ourselves. And we're left to play what I call a game of pickup basketball, which is you just literally are going and meeting strangers for the first time and everyone's kind of scrambling and the level of coordination, unless you're a real athlete, and I'm not. So I will say um, this just, you know, representing those of us in the bottom 30 or 40 percent of athletic ability. Um, when you show up at a um, at a basketball court and you don't know anyone, um, you're fumbling for a long time. And what American healthcare has become um, is what I call the great fumble, um, because everyone, no matter who you are, no matter how much social capital you have, um, if you're an older adult, you are going to be part of the great fumble. And that's because we've, we're operating within a system that pays for care and organizes care in ways that were relevant 40 years ago that are no longer relevant. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I think that we need to start thinking differently about built for purpose healthcare. And I'll just reference geriatricians. I now believe that part of the answer is, you know, we don't, we, I don't know that we have any geriatricians working at CMS right now. I think there's about 2000 geriatricians in the country I think 100 of them should go work at CMS for the next three years um, and begin to re-architect our system. We've been lost in this kind of crazy dialogue about fee-for-service Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. And um, I think they're both bad. Um, the both of them are underserving our older adults because both of them are derivative of, uh, der derived from each other. Um, and so I just think we have to take a big step back and acknowledge you know, the, the progress that Terry referenced, the, doubling in age uh, you know, over the last hundred years, but also recognize that the system that we built is, you know, Medicare is now, you know, 53 years old and it's time for a full reboot. I really like that analogy. And by the way, you managed to weave in uh, two different sports into your, your analogies. Um, so Susan, um, talking about clinicians and then family caregivers and family caregivers really play a major role in the healthcare of older adults. Um, and so navigating this complex set of health and social services um, that actually Dr. Jane was just referencing is really complicated. So what do you think needs to be done to ensure that family caregivers are properly educated and supported in the care of their loved ones? Well, thank you for having me. And I've Family caregivers are said again and again and again in this conversation. That's not typical. So I'm delighted to be part of this and, and thank you for including this focus on family caregivers. Just for those who don't follow this very much, uh, family, I think number one, professionals, all of us, you know, doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, uh, pharmacists, everybody really needs to think about the family caregiver in the picture. Really, really think about it. There's probably one there. There are uh, 48 million family caregivers, and we just released a report uh, called Valuing the Invaluable that estimates the free care that they're giving at $600 billion, billion. So they are the front line, whether it's long-term care or acute care, and they really need help. About half of them say they're worried. We did another study, uh, thanks to the John A. Harker Foundation, called Home Alone. Did it a couple of years ago, and then refreshed it in uh, right before the pandemic, 2019. And it shows that half of those caregivers, so more than 20 million people out there, are doing the kinds of things that we do. You know, doctors and nurses and therapists and dietitians. They're doing what we call complex care or intensive care, however you want to think about it. And most of them say they had to learn on their own which is rather shocking when you think about it. And I loved um, the, the concept of anticipatory guidance. I love that. I'm always saying it. it's the first time I heard someone say that recently. So thank you for that. Because family caregivers don't know what to ask in general. When we do research with them, they don't know what they don't know. That's what they say. So it's up to us as healthcare professionals, social service providers to be thinking, what could they, should they be asking? and learn how to talk in a way that invites people in and doesn't make them feel ridiculous for asking the question or not knowing what to ask. So first of all, I think it's clinical practice ourselves to teach. Um, and, and then it's really preparing someone for the work that they're gonna be doing. And it is work, there's no doubt about it. So what kind of um, training can you give them? What kinds of materials? We've 
developed again with help from the John A. Hartford Foundation and others a set of videos showing uh, care, and they're free, showing caregivers how to give an injection, how to do peritoneal dialysis. I mean, it's incredible what's going on in homes. So we, we really need to provide more of those resources. I think we also took that research, ARP did, my, my advocacy folks, not me, did uh, got this through in 45 states and territory known as the CARE Act. And it's doing just what we should be doing, asking somebody, every patient, no matter what their age or diagnosis, if they have someone who's going to be helping them. And if so, do you want them in your, your health care record? And if so, let's involve them in the care all along and make sure that they know when they're going to be discharged and have what they need to be able to do the care. So it's pretty basic. It's hard to believe we need it laws to make that happen. And right now we are gonna refocus again on implementing this CARE Act across the country. Um, there is a national strategy I should just mention, the RAISE Act, that is pretty phenomenal, that there is bipartisan support across both houses, the House and Senate, for really supporting family caregivers. And we can talk more about that under policy if you would like later. Thank you, Susan. Um, you know, some of the points you're making are so important because um, it's breaking down assumptions uh, and, and understanding need. And Wendy, I wanted to ask you a, a question here that I think is becoming critically important, um, which is increasing concerns around ageism and, and perceptions and assumptions around ageism. And, you know, the population actually has been unfortunately referred to as a silver tsunami, which actually flies in the face of what Terry's talking about. Instead of describing it as actually a triumph that we have people that are living longer, in fact, it's looked at as, as a tsunami instead. So can you talk a little bit about in your practice and in the healthcare system, how ageism manifests? Um, what are the words that we should be using um, when we're talking about this population or when we're actually in an exam room or talking to family members? Yeah, so, you know, I think this is important and there has been the concept of, you know, rather than the silver tsunami, which seems like, you know, it's the disaster coming that we should think about this as the silver reservoir and that we have this population of very wise folks um, who we can rely on. And it speaks a lot to the importance of setting up intergenerational um, places of community. Um, you know, I think that even myself as a practicing, one of those 2000 practicing geriatricians, you know, I deal with sort of the most complex of the complex. And these are often folks who do have cognitive impairment and everything else. And yet, um, I even catch myself sometimes, you know, walking into that exam room and thinking, you know, like, oh, well, I'm going to assume that they are demented until they prove otherwise. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, totally the wrong approach. And the idea is that, you know, co cognitive issues are not a normal part of aging. Yes, it increases um, with aging. But even even the statement that, you know, up to 20 percent of folks may require long-term care, only 20% of folks may require long-term care. I mean, people, th this idea that, you know, cognitive impairment, disability dysfunction is like written in stone, we have to get rid of those thoughts. And I actually just want to use a quote from members. Um, you know, we actually, um, in Kaiser Permanente Colorado look very closely at a number of diversity issues within the comments we get from our members, and that includes um, comments about ageism. Um, and one patient actually said, you know, the doctor listens, asks qualifying questions, and treats me with respect despite my age. Um, and, you know, went on to say, sometimes I'll challenge what he's offering. Um, he's never offended and always provides supporting statistics or medical reasoning. And then we do still see things um, that come across where, you know, people are making comments around, well, you're not in your 40s anymore. Um, and, you know, those are the types of things that we, we need to be cautious of. Um, and that it is not inevitable that everyone is going to have, um, you know, problems. And, you know, the idea is just because 
you know, this one knee is hurting. The other knee is also in its 80s and it's not hurting. So it's not about the being in the 40s kind of thing. Um, so I think that part of this is being sure that we are not um, taking that approach of being condescending and and really being open to the fact that, you know, healthy lifespan is is can really be quite long. And so I think that this concept of focusing on the individual in front of you and really getting to know them um, and understand, you know, what they are worried about. Um, and a lot of it is these these age beliefs that even people themselves come into the office with are, are, are very damaging. I mean, there's been research suggesting that people with negative age beliefs um, actually have um, worse function and um, are more likely to die. I mean, if you if everyone had healthy age beliefs, we would all be living seven years longer on average. That's about the same increase as if we just got rid of all cancer. So the, the concept of how we think about aging and that idea of not making those assumptions, but coming in and asking questions. Um, last thing I'll say, I will never forget, I had a patient, the daughter was very, very concerned about, the patient was, I think, 98 um, with end-stage renal disease and lots of comorbidities. And the daughter was just shocked that her mom could be so sick. And it wasn't until I realized that her mom and every one of her relatives had lived to 105 or beyond that I knew why they were so concerned. And that put things in perspective. So again, I think it's basic, good asking questions and not taking things for granted. Hey, thank you, Wendy. Um, Terry, I, I wanted to, to ask you sort of a question here around, this is so important. You know, when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, a lot of times I have not heard age actually weaved into that conversation. So I, I'm interested in hearing your perspective on what we need to be thinking about from the standpoint of systemic health disparities um, as they relate to age. Um, and what do we need to be thinking about as healthcare organizations uh, to meet the needs um, and to be able to speak to that? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And I just want to thank you know, Dr. Jane and Dr. Gustansi for making this conversation real by bringing in the, the narrative of the patient and the caregiver. It just, it always snaps people's heads when it's like there's data and there's all this, but listen to the stories, it's so true. So we, we do know ageism is, is pervasive and dangerous, but particularly there is enormous human suffering when it comes to communities that are uh, quote unquote, in the minority. And we saw that in COVID with nursing homes and we saw the disproportionate harm in communities of color when it came to their well-being and their, and their survival. So please, we can do better than that. And I think that, you know, I'm very, very uh, moved by my friend, Dr. Sharon Bragman, who's at Syracuse um, Upstate Medical Center, who said that her fear right now is that people are just going to start checking a box on DEI and saying, oh, yeah, we've got that program. No, you don't until you feel it very deeply and you embed that work. And I've, I recommend any of you to listen to her comments about what goes on. So, so research has shown that controlling for usual variables, if the older person is diverse, their outcomes will be worse. And we've been hearing that way too long. And it's like, it's up to us to make sure that we're not just naming variables, but we are acting on those variables. And I think Kaiser actually does a really good job on that. I think that I, you know, I had the great privilege of working with all of you for quite some time and seeing you worry about food and shelter and, and all the things that we know lead to a better life without just ignoring people because they're older. We know that older adults experience more harm. So they, they also are undertreated for pain very often, or they might get way too much treatment, which are just insidious ages, ages practices that we are unaware of. And, you know, as nurses, not only do I observe it, but I check myself on regular occasions to not anticipate and think about, oh, because you're this age. We try to, we do focus on function in our organization. We're working with CMS to try to get some functional measures for payment. 
because the time we've now been 40 years at counting falls, we can do better than that. We've been talking about Max's left knee for years, Wendy. And so it's like, come on, people, we can do better. And we particularly are worried about diagnostic error in older adults because of the assumptions that are brought on by aging, where you make an, you, you, because all of us need to compute many things in the moment of a clinical in, uh, engagement, you can come to the wrong diagnosis very quickly. So we're working with uh, the Society for Improving Diagnostic Metals and, and that work is led by the Moore Foundation. So finally, I wanna just remind people to really have a sensitivity to cultural norms and preferences, especially important in our country where we are so, we're such a melting pot with so many countries of origin, religions and healthcare beliefs. It also it makes it hard to be primary care, but kind of cool to be primary care because you have this jigsaw puzzle in front of you all the time. Thinking about the intersection of ageism with other forms of discrimination, that can compound the problem are LGBTQ communities, older women, older people who have lived lives with disabilities their entire life and now just happen to be older. So, you know, for people who it used to be that if you had Down syndrome as a child, you, you didn't live a very long life and that's not the case anymore. So we have to make sure that we're making decisions not for, but with those people to find out how, what kind of care they need in their, in their life long journey. So our age-friendly health system really does a great job on that. And I want to do a shout out to Dr. Faith Mitchell from the Urban Institute, who's one of our senior advisors and has done such a great job on that. Finally, last point, name your age. How many of you uh, tell people how old you are? I'm 69. And it's hilarious to me how people will not say their number and they, they, um, they just laugh and blow it off. So until we can name our numbers, where are we going, guys? So I, I think just call out people on that now and then. It's kind of interesting. And back to you, Steve. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Thank you, on, on the it. point of just on the on the point of LGBTQ plus older adults, I just you know want to um, kind of share some work that we've been doing, which is we launched you know the nation's first LGBTQ plus oriented uh, Medicare Advantage plan. It's called the Affirm product. And when we started it, we did it in part to just you know, I think offer solidarity to um, LGBTQ plus older adults who have not been acknowledged. Um, and, you know, much to our surprise, we have over 600 members who are now enrolled in this plan in just one year of, of offering it. Um, so I think a big part of our responsibility is to really affirm the experience of aging for all older adults. Um, and just wanted to make sure I shared that example uh, as a follow-up to Terry's comments. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sachin. And, um, I, we're going to pivot to your questions that are coming in, and thank you for um, participating in the conversation. Please keep them coming. Um, Susan, I want to ask you the policy question. Um, what does need to be on the table um, when it comes to, we've heard some references earlier, um, what needs to be prioritized? Um, one of the, the questions here is actually specifically talking about geriatrics, um, and, and I'll, I'll paraphrase here, there's sort of geriatric competencies, um, having enough geriatricians around, uh, enough support um, when it comes to teams and team-based support. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you think we need to be focusing on. Well, I certainly think uh, thinking about the workforce is huge. Um, you know, recent data showed that something like 24% of the nurses who are saying that they plan on leaving the profession are new nurses, which is unprecedented. I don't have the data for doctors or for others. This is only for nursing. But we really need to think about retention and really changing the way we work. Uh, there's talk about virtual nursing. I'm holding an event on May 23rd, actually, to see what the systems are doing. Perhaps some of your folks have some wonderful ideas of what's going on. I also wanna get back to family caregiving. I had mentioned the, um, the national strategy that came out of um, the, the work across the aisle, as, as we say. And in fact, uh, Dr. Fulmer, Terry, is funding work on this, on implementing these recommendations. There's like 500 of them. And some of them are like implementing the CARE Act is, is actually one of them. But there's other things. There's like caregiver tax credits. The financial strain on family caregivers is huge. It's about $8,000 out of pocket a year. And if you are 
live more than a, a mile away, an hour away, I'm sorry, it is like almost $12,000 a year. So it's it's a lot of money going out of pocket for family caregivers. They need help. They need uh, the, the training opportunities, as I said. They need respite. So we need to, at federal and state levels, get funding for respite, paid sick leave, paid family leave. There's a whole lot of recommendations that we will be working. And even navigator tools. You talked earlier about you know, care managers, strangers to everybody. What are the tools that can help family caregivers in your systems and in other systems to get around? All of that is being considered now. You know, you, you brought up a really important question um, that comes up in terms of the workforce and the availability of the workforce and what that future looks like. And then you also brought up the idea of, um, you know, virtual care um, and, and extension of those teams. Uh, Wendy, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Um, what what does care look like? What's a care location going to be, say, even just three to five years from now? Um, wh what do we need to be planning for? So, I, I mean, I think that some of it is about connecting connecting that interdisciplinary team virtually in such a way that it still feels like there is a single point of contact for the patient and caregiver. And I think that's a lot of the work that we have been trying to do um, you know, locally and nationally across Kaiser Permanente. Um, you know, one of the examples is, you know, we don't we don't have enough geriatricians. Um, and so, you know, we also can't have everybody coming in to see um, a geriatrician. And so part of it is how do we use geriatricians as a specialist, like a consultant? And we've developed, you know, um, electronic consultation so that we really are using it as a way of teaching and educating folks because you ask a couple of questions about how do I manage behaviors in a complex patient with dementia and you get answers and suggestions back. And by about the you know third or fourth time, you have then educated that primary care provider on how to help manage the next one potentially without that. And so to me, that's an example of that geriatricization that we have to do because, you know, the, the demographics say that we, we all have to be able to take care of older adults um, and complex older adults. And so I think that that's one of the pieces. And then I think the other piece is driving so much more care into the home um, and trying to limit the amount of you know, travel to different places. And I think that that does a couple of things. One, to actually be able to video conference call in, you know, the daughter who's in Pennsylvania with the patient, you know, who's down in Colorado Springs. And so everyone's together and having that discussion with the primary care provider and the oncologist, if that's the case, with maybe the care coordinator on the call as well. Those are the types of things that I think, you know, this is a silver lining from COVID that we learned that you could do really detailed palliative care discussions with people when we were saying like nobody can come into the building um, and we have to do this virtually. And a lot of those, you know, very difficult conversations, um, I think we're still able to have. There also are still a lot of programs where we go into the home. Um, and I think, you know, even if the nurse is going into the home or the medical assistant or even the paramedic, and then they're they're setting up the video to bring in the other care team members. I mean, those are the ways that we are going to be providing more of this care for our aging population. Mind if I mind if I chime in on this care to the home point? Um, so I I totally agree with um, Dr. Grzanski about um, the need to bring more care to the home. I I do worry a bit about um, the added burden that we're actually putting on caregivers when we do move more and more care to the home. Um, just to make it personal again, I had the experience of um, trialing my dad on uh, peritoneal dialysis and saw firsthand how difficult it is um, to actually execute peritoneal dialysis. You know, you're producing literal five bags of urine, five pound bags of urine um, 
that need to be emptied. And if you're an older adult living by yourself, it's just not possible. Uh, and even if you have all the support in the world, it's, it's actually quite difficult and more challenging. And there is a bit of toxic positivity in, health, in the healthcare industry right now around moving care to the home because it, on, on the face of it, it makes a ton of sense. Um, and that there are many homebound people who, to, who otherwise wouldn't even get care. Um, but on the flip side, uh, I think you know, things like hospital at home have to be considered really carefully uh, because a lot of what we're doing is taking work that was otherwise done by um, nurses and, and PCAs in the hospital and pushing it uh, to the home with unpaid caregivers and expecting, and then the, the entity operating the hospital at home um, kind of piece is expecting to get paid um, the same as if they were doing all that work and paying others to do all that work. And so um, again, I, I'm fully supportive. We've, we've launched four home-based care uh, medical groups at SCAN. So, uh, you know, we definitely believe in it, but I just wanted to introduce that cautionary note. I totally, totally agree with that. And, you know, and I think then part of it as well is then what do we do within our nursing homes, assisted living, you know, or hospitals to make that a more age friendly place and have some of those things. I mean, if it's, if it's even the idea of, you know, making sure that the patient I saw yesterday who was like, I have to go home because Rosie's there and that's his dog. And the idea is like, well, he can't go home right now, but I can get the dog to come visit him. And so I think it's some of both. We have to figure out where is the right place and how do we bring those things that are going to provide that healing environment? And it may not be the same thing for everyone. I love that. And if I could add to that, Wendy, you know, we're talking about a healthcare system, which does not mean a hospital. And people confuse that all the time. We're talking about a continuity of care across settings and some people, places that might be a federally qualified health center and other places it could be any number of places. But I also want to say we need the right care at the right time, the right person. And, you know, I want to give a shout out for the uh, wonderful geriatric ED, you know, emergency department accreditation program that has been going on nationally, as well as the geriatric surgical verification program uh, that, that can help this audience because that verification certification has been life-saving to so many people. But let's face it, we're talking about most people don't need, you know, regular surgeries. Most people need to do well at home. And I think that's the point you're both making. And I couldn't agree more. You know, Terry, this is uh, an important this is an important question here that I'm looking at um, that speaks to, we were talking about, you know, provision of care. Maybe we can talk also about, is it right to provide care or what, what is the right care? So, and the, the term here is life prolongation as opposed to um, quality of life. Um, and, and how do we address goals of care and how do we do that better um, as a healthcare system? And I, I'm curious, Terry, your take on that. Yeah, this is again, been a conversation for decades. And um, I think that we're talking about quality of life and we're talking about reducing human suffering. And we're talking about it in the context of a team that knows the older person in their family with an older person who, even if they have some dementia, might have capacity. And so we need to advise everybody to get their documents in place, make sure that your doctor or your lawyer know who's your proxy, what's your, do you have a, a, you know, a, a living will? Do you have your finances in the place that they need to be? And a lot of people worry, particularly, you know, you, you might be on Medicaid, you might be on Medicaid and Medicare, but you might be that person in the middle who will be in, in a, a place where you can lose your assets if you don't have uh, the help that you need. And there are a lot of systems in this country. AARP is one of them, but a lot that, that uh, you know, when you go on Social Security, when you go into your Medicare uh, organizations, your Medicare Advantage organizations that Sachin can talk about better than me, you know, they, they are there to help you. Uh, make plans and to anticipate. And, and I think that just normalizing those conversations instead of having people be afraid of them. Here's an example. As a nurse, when I see patients and start talking about, do you have a proxy? They think they're going to die. So you have to be very thoughtful and careful about the way you approach it. And I do think 
Others have said the same thing, normalizing that conversation, particularly with your children and your grandchildren. And if I could build on that, I just, I think this is all about that anticipatory guidance piece in that, you know, we, we, we do this counseling for parents, you know, and the idea of like, you know, you're going, you're, you're pregnant. What do you, what do you expect if you're going to be pregnant? What do you expect in years X, Y, and Z? And I think that we need to get to a place where having that same um, anticipatory guidance and thinking about it and, you know, like, I, of course, as a geriatrician, am the person who's like, oh, well, if I'm looking for a home, I have to make sure that there's like, you know, on the first level, there has to be a bath and a walk-in shower and, you know, like everything has to be able to live on one floor. But most people don't go into like, you know, thinking about that when buying a home, that's my geriatric training. Um, and so the, the concept of some of those basic things, and some of it's also about the medical care we provide, the idea that, yes, that medicine that you have been taking for 20 years, you just may not need anymore. You may need a lower dose. You are not physiologically exactly the same. Um, and I think that that type of education, um, we've got to find a way to package that. And I think Dr. Jane's point around like, what are the inflection points? You know, do we start it when you get your AARP card? Um, do we start it, um, you know, when you turn 65? I think we probably need to think about what are, what are those key points where we keep readdressing those things? Susan, you know, I... Um... I'm interested in one of these questions that the the reference to seniors actually having to you know pay down and and actually um, get to the point where they qualify for Medicaid programs and and so it can be financially devastating. Um, can you talk a little bit about what might need to be done from an advocacy perspective um, to prevent that from happening and um, I'll throw in a, a, another sort of question, which is, you know, the PACE clinics and the PACE concept, which has been around for a long time now. Um, what should we be thinking there? I'm afraid to speak. Every time I speak, I think I get frozen. <laughs> I'll try. There is some promise in the state of Washington that has created what they're calling CARES, and it is long-term care insurance, basically, that you, you pay into. It's not an enormous amount of money. Uh, to begin with, but it, we hope it will grow. I was just with them in Sweden. We went there together um, looking at the Swedish system. Of course, we're not Sweden for sure, <laughs> but I think Washington State is offering hope. California is trying to follow suit uh, because otherwise it is spending down until you're on Medicaid and your family caregiver. That's about what we have right now. So it's not really much of a system. And unfortunately, many, if not most older people and People in general think that Medicare is going to pay for long-term care. It is such a shock to them to find out that it isn't. I once said to CMS years ago, you should put a plaster CMS, but Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Just put it right up there. Let everybody know about it because they don't really want to talk about the future. They think it's going to be okay. Nobody likes to talk about it anyway. But if they do, they think that Medicare is going to take care of me. So we really have to um, find better sources of funding. Um, Stephen, if I could just say on the PACE model, um, you know, we think it's one of the most compelling models that exists um, to keep older adults healthy and independent. It is an expensive model. Um, it is overall a cost savings model for the healthcare system, um, but it takes a lot to execute it. Um, we launched an entity in partnership with Commonwealth Care Alliance called um, My Place Health, um, which is really intended to, um, you know, try to scale the PACE model uh, you know, as, as broadly as we can. Um, I think it is one of the models that has gotten a little bit uh, mucked up over the last couple of years as there's been kind of the, uh, um, the entry of now for-profit PACE programs, um, you know, some of which have had a number of compliance and regulatory issues associated with it. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges we have in the, in kind of with the silver tsunami, so to speak, is that lots of folks see this as a huge profit opportunity. And there's a ton of abuse, I think, that's happening in older adults um, because there's federal funding for programs that support them and people are looking at them as a margin opportunity rather than a, as a service opportunity. And so, um, again, I think part of what we need to do is build guard, ethical guardrails around businesses that so, serve older adults because 
um, they are a population that is, I think, uniquely vulnerable to um, uh, abuse as well as profiteering. Sachin, um, I wanted to ask you about um, the topic of mental health and loneliness in this population. Um, Dr. Vivek Murthy, you know, the current U.S. Surgeon General, has been quite articulate, both in written and spoken form, about this and the the fact that, uh, and certainly probably was exacerbated with the experience of the last three years. Uh, many of us have seen that as clinicians in in our clinics um, in terms of the effects. Um, what additional sort of home or community-based services do we need to be thinking about to serve older adults? Um, how do we deny, need to design these services and really so that we can address social isolation, loneliness? Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, we have to start talking about the problem. And I think the Surgeon General is definitely, you know, I think elevated the prominence of it. Vivek's, um, I think, just done a, a fabulous job of that. Um, having spent the last six or seven years actually building and scaling programs, uh, you know, aimed at addressing the needs of, of lonely older adults, um, I actually think programs is the wrong answer. Um, we need more of a social movement around this, this particular issue. We need a new social contract with each other. Um, we need to reinvest in neighborhoods, reinvest in community, um, rethink, you know, kind of the direction of the American family. Uh, because I, I do think we've lost a lot over the last number of decades. You know, before Vivek Murthy, there was um, Robert Putnam who wrote, you know, the now iconic book, Bowling Alone, um, which is, you know, kind of a, a tip in the hat in the direction of the fact that there were more people bowling in America, but fewer people participating in bowling leagues. Um, and he used that as a, you know, I think as, a, as an image to kind of really draw out what's happening right now in American society. And I think it is because for all kinds of reasons, we've we've decided that doing things by ourselves is 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 better or more optimal, um, maybe in the moment. But we're losing something, you know, longer term. And so again, I think it's about thinking about a different social contract, different thinking differently about our communities, think differently about our participation in civic life and community organizations. The healthcare system can only do so much. And I think one of the big problems that we have as an industry is we've we've we're not great at executing on healthcare, so we've started looking at other things that we can do. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're trying to build programs on social determinants of health. There's health systems that are operating food pharmacies. My God, um, like what we, what we need to be doing is like actually executing on great healthcare delivery. But then I think doing the work, um, not just as healthcare professionals, but actually executing as as you know, members of a society, members of a community, building more connective tissue uh, in that regards and building more um, of a focus on reinvigorating our civic life. I, I just don't think, you know, everything needs to be addressed in the exam room. Thank you. You know, we're coming close to the end of our time together. Um, so I wanted to maybe quickly go around the, the room here um, and ask each one of you, maybe in 30 seconds to a minute, um, what gives you hope for the future? Um, and, and what what is the the next big sort of innovation intervention um, that we as healthcare providers or healthcare professionals um, can do? Um, and so why don't I start with you, Wendy? Um, you know, I think what gives me the most hope is that if we can um, develop, uh, you know healthcare systems that provide optimal care and keep folks healthy as they age, that is going to improve the health and the experience for every single person. Because I think that the concepts that we're talking about um, are really the things that are going to improve healthy aging across and going to improve how everyone is experiencing care, because a lot of it is about, um, you know, what I would call the, the precision medicine of understanding the context of the person in front of you and how they want to be cared for. Um, and I think that that's a lot of what geriatrics is. Um, and that that is going to then translate into better care for 
children and young adults and middle-aged adults, as well as older adults. And I think that it is the policy changes that we're going to need to see in order to care for our silver reservoir that is going to then also improve the healthcare for everyone else. So I think if we get it right here, um, we should be moving the entire country in a better direction. That's my hope. Thank you, Wendy. Terry, if I could turn to you next. Sure. I, three things come to mind that make me very optimistic. First is the pace of science. People would have died from some of the cancers they have right now. And I am seeing survival rates that I couldn't have imagined. The pace of science in this world is so dramatic. Uh, that that just gives me optimism that, you know, it'll all boats will rise. The next thing is artificial intelligence, and it's here to stay. And I think that it'll be very helpful to us. And I think that for, for any of us who are worried that they're going to take over, uh, that the machines are going to take over, I, I, I don't believe that that's where we should be focusing. I think we should focus on what the opportunity is. And then finally, I'm thinking about the leveling that has gone on over the past 20 plus years between patients and clinicians, patients and doctors. My grandmother would never ask a physician a question. She wouldn't dare. First of all, she'd be afraid that she looked stupid. She'd be afraid that she was being rude. That's all changing. And of course, we have the boomer generation coming on that want a lot of things yesterday. And, and I think we all welcome this change up. Let me give you the example of nursing assistants, always treated so poorly, usually a community of women of color. Now, post-COVID, individuals who are in a very different location in terms of their voice. And I just think that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Susan, if I could turn to you next. Sure. I, I think what gives me the most hope is that we no longer have our head in the sand. It seems like for so long, people on this phone, people listening in have been saying, this is coming, there's aging population, da, 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 and nothing, nothing. To have things like this national strategy on family caregiving, to have the, the national strategy on Alzheimer's and dementia, to have bipartisan support, like there's nothing that gets bipartisan support, right? Aging is starting to get that family caregiving. So I mean, not to say things are moving really fast, but it's not as political. It's really more human and people are understanding it largely because they're experiencing it with their families. And um, that gives me hope that we can be more creative. We can um, think not just about policies, but programs. I love what you had to say, put all these geriatricians and geriatric nurse specialists, et cetera, at CMS and rethink the whole thing. Because I don't think we could have designed it worse if we tried. So how do we like really shake things up? And I'm hoping that this momentum, like an event like this and, and the people that you have gathered together, um, not just us, but those listening in, really want change. And so that gives me hope we'll get it. Thank you. And Sachin, just to close. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hopeful about all the things that, you know, um, everyone else uh, just, just mentioned. Um, in particular, I, I think the science piece is just is really remarkable. I mean, there's a breath, you know, you know, we have a tendency to demonize the pharmaceutical industry, the biotech industry because of, the, of their pricing. But like, let's just talk for a moment about diseases that were previously untreatable that are now turning into chronic diseases. I mean, it's it's breathtaking, it's incredible, and it wouldn't happen um, without them. And I'm, I'm saying that as a managed care leader, so um, take that for what it's worth. What, what I will, will say is gives me the most hope is really like the young people who are um, in training today, um, nurses, doctors, uh, pharmacists, um, the, the purity of their ethical intent around the work um, is, is unrivaled. And I think, it, you know, not, not like anything I've seen in the, in the previous generations of clinicians. Um, you know, it used to be that if you wanted the biggest house on the street, you went to medical school. Um, these days, you don't get the biggest house in the street if you go to medical school <laughs> um, uh, and you're not driving the nicest car. Um, but you still have, you know, contrary to like popular reports of the decline of the profession, you have just absolutely incredibly gifted, smart, intelligent, thoughtful, um, ethical, heartfelt, you know, kind of people becoming uh, medical students and doctors and nursing students and nurses. And um, and so, you know, they always give me hope. I think we have to now 
support them from a leadership perspective by giving them a system that they actually want to work in. <laughs> um, and that's up to us. Um, we can't wait for them to fix that. So, um, you know, that's where a lot of my energies are these days is I think, you know, trying to address what I think is a leadership crisis in healthcare. I think we've kind of gotten away with um, kind of a, a you know, uh, administration as opposed to leadership. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can kind of you know, turn the dial on that. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Drs. Fulmer, Gazanski, Reinhardt, and Jane for joining us today. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you all uh, in the audience for joining us on this extremely important topic, um, deeply meaningful um, and, and deeply impactful. Um, thank you for your commitment to our patients um, and to the country.